Amen. Are you awake? Sunday afternoon. Only radical people will come out this time of the day, <laughs> which is good. <laughs> it is good. That's what we want. We want radical people um, so that God can transform our lives. All right, so I'm reminded of, of this morning, actually, um, let me just filter through all the things. I always have like 100 things running at the same time, operating system in my brain. <laughs> I need to <laughs> close some apps and open the right ones in my brain so that I bring over the right things that the Holy Spirit wants to share with us. But let's start this evening in Psalm 91, seeing that it went out in the prophecy. God spoke to us, Psalm 91. And it's interesting, remember Psalm 91 was written by Moses. It's not David, it's Moses. And we have, ach, dis die vreselik, hou net die papier van my, gaan weg my. Sal hem opruit. So I'm going to read in the King, King James Version, and let's start verse 1. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. I will say of the Lord, He is my, well, I read it. Verse 3, surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings shall you trust. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. You shall not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flies by day, nor for the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor for the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand shall fall at your side. 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, your habitation. Oh, that is powerful. All right. These shall no evil befall you. Neither shall any plague come near your dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. They shall bear you up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against the stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the adder, and the young lion and the dragon shall you trample under feet, because he has set his love upon me. All right. Think up to there, for now it is sufficient. Today we are living in a, a time and an age where we are programmed by everything that's going on around us. We are programmed by the media, by television, by newspapers, by YouTube, by Facebook, by you name it. Man, it's all out there. And people send things around, and, and it's all these things. And it can be a good thing, but it can be a bad thing as well. Who knows that? Because you are programmed by what you take in constantly. As a man think in his heart, so easy. What you behold, you become. Um, it's interesting, there in... Oh, this is probably going to sound horrible. It's going to be a horrible example, but I've seen it with my own eyes. You know, if you have somebody that works in a specific field, have you seen sometimes their physical appearance even change to the thing that they are working with? I've seen <laughs> a farmer that had a crocodile farm. You fill in the blank. All right. 
He already, he already started to grow a little tail. No, no, he didn't. All right. But what you behold is what you become. God has created us. God has created us to behold his glory so that we become it. All right. He wants us to look into that splendor of the one that is seated upon the throne, the source of life, the source of glory, so that you can be transformed into that image and likeness. But the issue is, you are constantly beholding either nonsense or half-truths or things that stimulate the flesh. So let's throw a couple of foundations. In John chapter 4, I think it's John 4, where the, the Samaritan woman comes and Jesus is at the well of Jacob. And here comes the woman, of, uh, uh, woman from Sam Samaria, and she walks, and he started giving a word of knowledge concerning a life. You all know that story. And there Jesus reveals a truth. And that truth is God is spirit. Everybody say, God is spirit. God is spirit. Can you see spirit? Can you see spirit? No, you can't see spirit. Why? Because spirit is in a different dimension. We are living in a specific dimension which is awesome because God placed you in a dimension which is called a physical realm, but you are an integration of unseen with seen. That's what we call faith. Faith is being persuaded of the unseen, and then it manifests in the seen. So God created you as his vessel, as his object, as his legal agent in a seen realm. God even, just hear me right, I'm going to explain it to the full now. God even couldn't manifest in a fleshly form except when he became flesh. All right. So that's why the Bible says, great is the mystery of godliness. Great is this mystery of the unseen God. God became flesh, seen of angels. This is in the book of Timothy. Taken up in glory. All right. So this is the mystery of godliness. The unseen became seen. That realm that people talked about and longed for and people are worshiping the wind and others look at the northern lights and they worship that. Why? Because somewhere there's a something in them that cries. We know there's an unseen something that's higher than us. In the book of Ecclesiastes, it says, God has placed eternity in man's hearts to show to man that nothing under the sun can satisfy him except God alone. So there's something, there's a dissatisfaction in a human being that can only be satisfied by God. He's the only one that can fill that blank. People fill it with drugs, they fill it with whatever things. We all know what people are capable of. And they try and fill it with everything, but only God can fill that gap. Yep. And that is for the, you can fill in a lot of explanations. It's a hunger for the supernatural, a hunger for the unseen, a hunger for God. It comes down to the same thing. People long for God. But the way that God operates is, or the way that God operates in a seen realm is through seen vessels. Are you with me? Are you catching the drift already? You are the seen vessel. 
God created you. Psalm 102, Psalm 118, Psalm 132. He says, I have desired Zion, and this will be my dwelling place forever. The set time to favor Zion has come. It's my resting place, it's my temple, it's my dwelling place. It's where I will be manifested. Everybody say manifest. What is manifest? Manifest is just unseen realm, seen. In the unseen realm, Jesus paid in the heavenlies for sickness and disease and to restore us back to God He already paid for that, but that's in the unseen realm. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, blessed are you with all spiritual blessings. But the issue is, in heavenly places. (laughs) Blessed are you with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Man, I need it in earthly places. I need to see that blessing manifest. Otherwise, I'm just gonna be a religious Christian that goes along smooth sailing and, oh, don't worry, I'm blessed, brother. But your car is glued together with bumper stickers. Or you can't even walk because of all the pains and everything that you've got. That's not what God has for you. God desires fruit. Fruit is another word for manifestation. It says, it gives your father good pleasure if you bear much fruit. God is in the fruit-bearing business. He's not just in sowing, plowing, watering. The main aim for that is fruit. A farmer, show me one farmer that just Sows. My work is sows, and I'm a sower, and I'm a sower, and I'm a sower. One day, what I'm going to reap is sowing. No, I want to reap a harvest. The harvest is the manifestation of the truth. And that's the aim. That's God's desire for you. And you better fix it in your mind, otherwise you're going to believe in a bad God that tries to teach you things through sufferings. And then you're not going to understand that his desire is fruit bearing. He desires more than you that you are healthy. In fact, he manifested health 2,000 years ago. The issue is we are schooled in the wrong school. We are schooled in the school of natural. Let me explain that. You are schooled in what the burger says, what the huisgenoot says, what uh, what all the 10,000 WhatsApp says, and what everybody else says, and we are schooled in that. Where if that is not in the finished work of Calvary and what Jesus did and in the resurrection, who knows, it's going to school you in the wrong school. All right, so let's explain it a little bit more. Colossians chapter 3, 1, 2, and 3 says this. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things below. And Christ, who is your life, shall appear, and you shall appear with him in glory. Hallelujah. I think it's 2 Corinthians chapter 4 or chapter 5 here at the end, verse 21. It says, for our light momentarily afflictions is working for us an eternal weight of glory as long as... We don't look at the things that are seen, but at the things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are 
eternal. What do you see? How do you govern your life? How do you make decisions? Is it because of what you see, what you feel, or is it what you see? Is it what you, what you see with your faith, with your heart? If you look at, at a, a man and a woman of God, the reason why they are here today is because they see something. They see something and it's driving them and it's making them to do what they do. Otherwise, they are lying to themselves their whole life. They've seen something and it's in the unseen realm and now they're trying to teach earthly realm people <laughs> to be heavenly minded. Are you with me? That's sometimes tricky. <laughs> That's sometimes tricky because this fleshly guy, he's got all the toys and he can throw out all that fleshly toys, toys at you. All right? And he, and he can come with all the reasonings because he's schooled in that and, and man, he's trained in that realm. And, and we've got experts in the flesh realm. We, you need God to open the eyes of your understanding that you are enlightened with what's going on there. Now, there is not there somewhere. There is actually here. It's the secret place of the Most High. It is the finished work of what Jesus did for us, and God wants us to operate out of there. Another word for it is your closet. For God that sees in secret, or, or he says, when you pray, don't go in the street corners, fleshly realm, where people can see you, fleshly realm. Go to your closet, cl shut your door. And God that sees in secret will reward you, there's the fruit, openly. The manifestation, openly. All right. That does not mean I go to my house, I get into my cupboard, I close my door, and God that sees in my clothed cupboard will reward me openly. No. While I'm speaking to you, I'm in my closet. As I'm speaking to you, I'm connected to the Holy Spirit. I'm preaching out of that secret place where me and my father is busy communicating via channel, channel spirit. Am I in tune with my father? And what my father says, I say it. And to you, it's just a fleshly realm. There's a short guy standing in front and he's preaching something to you. But if you can see in the spirit, the words that I speak are not my words. It comes from the Father. Now, it's just to give you the concept, all right? That's why I say it. People can get weird around that. That's not my aim. The whole aim is you can be amongst people that's busy braying. Is there an English word for that? That's probably a legal English word already. No, that is just not right. All right. <laughs> All right. Luckily, everybody understands that word. It's a, it's a legal English word already, braying. All right. So you can be standing and in the midst of everybody else, and you're connected to him. In fact, it's those people that, that we call spiritual people. They're not spooky. They're not flaky. They're not, oh, hallelujah, somewhere they're cloud number nine. No, it's just somebody that's minding the things above. How do we do that? By Joshua chapter one. Moses prayed for Joshua. Joshua meditate upon this law. Let it not depart from your eyes. Keep it in the midst of your heart. Timothy, here comes Paul. Timothy, meditate 
upon God's word. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind by the washing of the water of the word. What you set your mind on determines if you are a soulish person or a spiritual person. Are you with me? God is spirit. And those that worship him must worship in spirit. Spirit. The whole thing is we are carnally minded. Yes, but I don't feel. I feel this. And people treat me this way and now I feel. Feelings are dangerous things. It's dangerous. Because feelings will lie to you or it will be contrary to the truth. Hebrews chapter 12. Let's look away. Seeing then that we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness. Let, let's look away from all that will distract by looking unto Jesus. The author and finisher of our faith. Then he goes on and he says, for just consider him that endeared such bitter hostility from men. Says, you have not yet resisted against sin like he did. He started sweating blood. He endured. So what you're going through is not a patch of what he went through. So he's saying, look away from what you are going through by looking to him. He gives you the focus. He gives you, gives you the focal point. Why? It's a setting of your mind. Are you with me? So God wants us to set our minds on him. Set your mind. Keep it set. Keep it set. And if you stumble, wash your mind again. Keep it set. And if you struggle again with other thoughts, because thoughts comes to you like fiery darts. In the book of James, he says that the enemy comes and he shoots his fiery darts at you. What do you need to do? Lift up the shield of faith, whereby you are able to quench all the fiery darts. What is your faith? Faith is to be fully persuaded. I'm persuaded that God is spirit Everything is provided in that realm, and my mind is there. Therefore, that manifests here. That's lifting up faith. The fleshly guy walks into the church, and he says, brothers and sisters, right, let's put on the armor of God. Let's do it. Put on faith, and we do it. And it's just a fleshly confession without any persuasion. And we've made church that way. I don't know if you, have you been there? Put on the armor of God every day and ne tomorrow you forget to do it and something goes wrong. Oh, it's because I didn't put on the armor of God. No, no, no. It's because you bumped your toe. <laughs> do we put on the armor of God? I am clothed with him. I'm clothed with him. You are clothed with him. Set your mind on what's already being done. Does it make sense? All right. So, where shall we go? Where shall we go? Where shall we go? Let's go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Bring your Bibles with. Oh, it's actually chapter 4. 2 Corinthians 4. And verse 17. And it says, For our light affliction is but for a moment. Oh, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not 
at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. All right. If you go to, I think it is Zechariah chapter 3, there is the story about the high priest Joshua that is brought in by, an, by the accuser, and he, you know the story, he's clothed with filthy garments, and here comes the Lord, and, he's, and, and he says, take away the filthy garments, put rich apparel on him, put a turban on his head, put a ring on his finger, restore him to what's really going on in the unseen realm. Because the earth contaminated him. Are you following? Must I repeat that? So you get contaminated by thoughts. You get contaminated by what you program yourself with. That's why you need the word of God daily to redirect you to the truth. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. How shall a young man keep his ways clean? By keeping it to the word of God, all right? So that is how God, but he comes and he uses your mind. Everybody say, my mind, all right? Your mind is extremely powerful and it's extremely important because the battle is right here. It's right here. It is your thoughts it is contrary thoughts or it is godly thoughts. And you need to start differentiating between those thoughts because we accept everything. Yes, but that's just the way it is, really. The way it is with a dead guy that's lying there is he's dead. The way God is, is Lazarus come forth. Death is not even in the mind of Jesus. Life is in his mind. That's a revelation and all if you really meditate upon that. All right. Now, let's just look at, at the throne room. I want you to picture the unseen father on the throne in the unseen realm, in the heavenlies. That source of light, of life, of whatever you can fill it in who he is. In that presence, is there any fear? Is there fear in the throne room? Is God sitting there chewing his nails and, oh my word, I didn't think, you know, when Corona came, oh, the church just horribly failed that one. We're going to write that test again, we horribly failed it, right? When Corona came, Jesus didn't chew his nails and like, oh my word, I did not think about this one. All right, and, and let's, let's organize something quickly. Um, elders, get a praying party ready. And, and this guy's, the, and there was no chaos in heaven. Nothing. In fact, there was worship. <laughs> the authority, the king, worthy is the lamb. That was what was going on there. But on planet Earth, chaos. <laughs> chaos, absolutely chaos. Why? Because suddenly, our flesh was stimulated again with physical things, wear a mask, do this, do this, and people were fighting on this, and shall we, and shall we not, and blah, 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 blah. And the flesh was just alive, 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 alive. Where the kingdom of God was just constantly going on. The kingdom of God did not change a bit. Corona didn't change anything in the kingdom. The way that God operates after that is not different to before it. What changed? We changed. <laughs> because the issue is we set our mind on what America said, on what doctors said, and what, it was horrible because we were forced to do some stuff, but we were supposed to set our mind on the things above. We were supposed to laugh through it. 
Now, I know there were horrible things that happened. I know there were many people that passed away. We don't laugh about that. But that just cries out to me that there's still a fallen state amongst men on planet Earth. And that, to me, is creation that's crying out for the sons of God to be made manifest, to set them free from this corruption and decay. But the sons of God, Romans chapter 8, let, let's go there, that, this is powerful. Romans chapter 8. Verse 5. For they that are after the flesh, do everybody say? Mind the things of the flesh. Okay, okay, okay. What do the fleshly guys do? They mind the things of the flesh. What makes you fleshly? Your mind. All right? But they that are after the spirit the things of the Spirit, right? For to be carnally minded is death. Oh, sorry, what is he talking about? <laughs> your mind, <laughs> all right? He's talking about your mind, your mind, your mind. To be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. Your thoughts, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. It's your thoughts. The battle is Golgotha, place of the skull. That's the battle. The giant was slain in the skull. The carnal mind, the giant, Goliath. All right? How was he slain? With five stones, the fivefold ministry, the church. The church brought the right mindset, healed the old, cut off his head, and brought the right mindset. <laughs> Supposed to do that, and we do it. So to be carnally minded is death. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither can it indeed be. First Corinthians chapter 2, I think it's either chapter 1 or chapter 2, it says the natural man cannot understand the things of the Spirit. For the things of the Spirit are spiritually discerned. In the same manner, you cannot judge a spiritual man. Because people now fleshly comes and they try and judge a spiritual man that's spiritually minded, and now they come with their fleshly excuses or tricks or whatever, and they judge this man according to the flesh, but they do not recognize what's going on in the unseen realm. Oh, man. God, God has done it, but God needs to help us that we get sensitive in the spirit so that we can identify the anointing. That we can identify where God is moving upon someone's life so that we can flow with it, get from it, drink from that fountain, be edified by it, be exhorted by it, and grow because of it. Did you follow what I just said? And he uses people for that. The issue today with the church is the world system, and this is what's called Babylon, it is the world system that infiltrated the church. So the church has, not this church, but in general, and I'm not trying to break down the church, I'm trying to actually lift up the true church. All right, so in general, the church has become a seeker-friendly environment to accommodate carnal people. And let's hear what you have to say. How should we have church? And, oh, let's, 
I'm going to say it. Let's allow gay marriages. Okay, let's keep you happy. Let's do it. And we take a mindset that is actually lying, incorporated with the truth, and create a system. It's called Babylon. It's called Babylon. It's in fact, it's a statue that's mingled with iron and clay and all these things, but the rock came and struck it and it's destroyed, which is Christ. Okay, something else. But the church is supposed to be the vessel of God's glory and his power to flow through so that people's lives can be changed, so that we can be equipped, so that we can go out and be a light in the world, so that God's power can flow through a vessel so that the, the unseen that is in you can be seen. Okay, it's a weird way of explaining it, but it's, it's exactly what it is. There's something that's in you, and it's Christ, the hope of glory. He's in you. The treasure is in earthen vessels. Why? So that he can be seen. The book of Corinthians says, you are a sweet fragrance of Christ. To some, a fragrance of death, and to other, a fragrance of life. To who are you a fragrance of death? To the carnal mind. <laughs> By the grace of God, we constantly try and slay the carnal mind. That's the sword we have in our hands. The spiritual mind just grows just grows constantly. But we need to, this is what it says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Principalities, powers, da, da, da. then he says, thoughts, everybody say minds, that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. What is our struggle about? Mindsets. You know what a stronghold is? Afrikaans has got a beautiful word for it. Hardekwaasheid. <laughs> right. It's a mindset that is set rigid in his ways, like a flint. No, no, this is, oh, I grew up in church, and this is how church needs to be, and, blah, blah. and if anything else gets out of this form. Your mind is supposed to be washed daily with present truth, with the flow of the Holy Spirit, with what God wants to do relevantly today. And you can't be stuck in 40 years backwards, because that's exactly where the guys were in the wilderness, stuck in a mind of Egypt. You know what they did? They said, they sat there in the wilderness and they said, we long for the flesh pots in Egypt. Oh, if we could just be back in Egypt. The Israelites, God's promised people, they said, oh, if we could just be back in Egypt where we could eat onions and leeks and garlic. And I don't know why they said that, man. I would say we could eat steak or whatever. And I'm going to let them on a blotter here. All right, in any case. So they longed for all those things in, in Egypt. Why? Because their minds were stuck in a slave mentality. We were used to getting up in the morning, get our straw, make our bricks, get our food. Pharaoh is happy. We are safe. Let's stay in that rut. Let's stay in that mindset of slavery, everything's happy, everything's fine. Here comes a guy with a different mindset out of the wilderness. He says, the great I am sent me. I'm going to set you free. Uh, we don't actually want it because we are safe in our comfort zone. They didn't say it. They believed it. They, they actually wanted to stay in that they longed back. Why did you bring us in the wilderness to die? And the next time something can happen, Moses, why did you bring us in the wilderness to die? Our corpses will fall. He says, you're right, as you think you will be. So the whole idea is God created you to be a son of God. A son is an heir of God. He wants you to have that mentality or mindset. You need the mentality of, man, have you seen the guys that, I know it's a 
just a movie, where they sit around the, the round table and they put their swords there and then they chat about what's going on in the kingdoms, all right? That's you. We're not the slaves. That's there on the horses or wherever outside busy. You are a son of God that God entrusts with his business, what's on his heart, on his agenda. He entrusts you with his glory. He entrusts you with his power and his ability. But as long as you have a mindset of a child, the Bible says you differ nothing from a slave, though you be heir of all. You're just like a slave. I, he can't entrust you with greater things. So the whole idea is, and actually goes on in, in Hebrews chapter 12, it says, for God is now, I said it last week, for God is now dealing with us as sons. Let's go on to perfection, the book of Hebrews. Let's now go on to perfection. That's what God has for us. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So I want you this week to go and sit with your Bible, ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you, and then go and read and wash your mind constantly with it. All right, I know this is, sounds horrible or it's a religious something, but man, it's better than doing nothing. You know this, the, uh, you get this little plastic boxes that has a verse for the day. All right? Get it. If you don't read Bible, at least get it, because you know what it does is you read it in the morning and then you meditate upon it through that day. You just keep that verse. Man, if you just keep one verse a day, you will see a change in your life. If you can read more, do it. There's, we all of us can actually read more. Then do it. But at least start with one verse. But meditate upon it. You know what I do? I put an X on my hand. So the one, when I work, I look at the X and I'm like, uh, oh, that's the verse. And I, so I remind myself. I mind myself again. It's like a cow that chews the grass and he swallows it and then he brings it up again and then he chews it again. That's how the word of God is. You need to constantly chew on it, chew on it, chew on it. You need to go through the week, go through all the verses. That's why it's important to have a notebook that you write down the verses and in the week you go through it again, go through it again, go through it again. It helps you. In, in the life groups or the cell groups, what we do is we discuss this word. What is it? It's just a reminding, a reminding, reprogramming with the word. All right, so watch out what you listen to. Watch out what you see. Watch out what you take in. Listen to what God says. Submit to what he's busy doing. Man, and you're gonna prosper. You're gonna see what God's gonna do. If we can be, you know, at, at the Tower of Babel, you know what the Bible says? And they all were of one mind and heart and speech. And God says, nothing is impossible for, impossible for these guys to do. Let's confuse them. When the day of Pentecost came, it says they were all of one mind and heart in one place. All right? So if we can be all of one mind, what mind? You, we have the mind of Christ. First Corinthians chapter 2. We have the mind of Christ. We have not the mind of the world. Be renewed. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. I think it's Romans 12, in the first couple of verses. All right. So, in fact, the Amplified says, be constantly renewed. It's a constant washing. All right. So, are we going to wash our minds? Man, it's going to set you free. It's going to set you free. So many people that struggle with issues when they set their minds. You know how many testimonies I've heard of guys that had cancer lying, dying in the bed, and the next moment something dropped in their minds. The moment something dropped in their minds, they saw the truth. Nothing physically, they didn't see anything physically, they saw a truth, then it manifested in their physical body. 
cancer gone instantly. Where did it start? In the mind. It's weird. It's awesome. I think it's powerful. But it just shows you how powerful it is. There's testimony upon testimony upon testimony of people that worked with the mind and then it manifested in the bodies. For good or bad. For good or bad. I sat one time with a psychologist. My wife was so angry. And uh, she said, you know what? This and this. And she just planted a seed that didn't happen in my life. But because she said it, I took it and started meditating upon it. And then it started manifesting in my life. And it was a lie. All right, so I don't know what example to use, but, and later I had to reprogram myself again and realize that was a lie. What's the truth? This is the truth. Oh, thank you. And I had to wash myself, wash myself, wash myself, and then I was free again. All right, so watch what you take in. Watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees. Watch out for the spirit of the world. You're not going to get spooky around it, but don't be programmed by the world. Do not be conformed to this world, but be renewed by the transforming, whatever it says. All right. So, Father, we thank you that you've spoken to us today, and we thank you that we are so excited about what you are about to do in our midst. We can see it in our mind's eyes. We can see it in the spirit. We can see it in the spiritual realm what you want to do. I thank you that you created us as spiritual vessels, spiritual beings. And you want to move in us. Lord, thank you that we, when we worship you, we worship in spirit and truth. We thank you that we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. We thank you that we can set our mind there. Keep it set there. Thank you that we've got access with the angels, with the saints, with the family that's already in heaven. We've got access there, the throne room. Thank you that we can come, that you did everything to open those doors that we can come with boldness to that throne room. Thank you that there's nothing that we can do that will disqualify us from going in there, except what we think, except if we just believe the lie that we're not good enough. Lord, we are good enough. You made us worthy because of the blood of the Lamb, and we can approach the Father at any time. In fact, there's an unbroken fellowship with our Father. And I thank you that we will start seeing that and that we will realize it. God is with us. We are with Him. And we want to see that fruit. We want to experience, we want to eat of that tree. I want to see it, Lord. I want to see it. I want to see it in your people. I want to see it in my personal life. I want to eat of that fruit of the tree of life which only comes from you. So I speak healing of your people's bodies right now. I speak an alignment with truth. I speak a unity with truth. A harmony, a peace with the truth. We surrender to your truth and now let the peace of God let it come into our hearts. Let it rule and govern our hearts right now. I speak to every storm and I say, peace. I speak to every situation, how bad it may look. I say, peace to that storm. Peace to your soul. If you are weary, if you are laboring, come to me. I will give you rest for your mind, for your soul. Because you are full of burdens and carrying so many things in your mind. And God says, come to me. Peace to you. Peace to your mind. Let your kingdom rule. 
in our minds, Lord. Let the kingdom of God rule in our hearts and our minds. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you. We thank you, Father. Everything is provided for in this kingdom. And we are born of that kingdom. We thank you for it. In the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen.